My name is Stephanie Rogers and I am the Executive and Artistic Director of the Anderson Center for Interdisciplinary Studies. And today I'm happy to be talking with Max Cora, who is a metal worker and artist who's been involved in the Anderson Center for a long time. Max, could you introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit about your artistic practice? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Max Cora and I deal mostly with metals. I do metal casting and metal fabrication. You've been with the Anderson Center for a long time. When did you start working at Tower View? Wow, I think it was 1996. Uh, the first event there when I showed up was a, they did an ice cream social out of the back of a pickup truck. Maybe we should bring about, that back. Yes, with about 10 people, that would be the right crowd size. And when did you know that you wanted to be an artist? I guess I always like fiddling with things, I guess you'd say. Taking things apart and making things out of sticks and whatnot. But I sort of fell into it as a profession. I had no idea what I wanted to do, really. How does one fall into a profession as an artist? Yeah, I met some interesting people along the way. Actually, I had a great sculpture teacher in high school. And then, met a really amazing foundry owner in Iowa and just kind of kept at it. You were close to Charles Biederman at the end of his life, correct? Yes. How did you meet Charles and what was your interaction with him like? I met him through Gita, who you know, and her grandparents were big supporters of Charles's and related to his wife. So I met him through her and we sort of hit it off and then I started going over pretty regularly. For a long time it was um, scotch at five was the rule. Oh. Two scotches at five <laughs> over at Charles's. <laughs> That sounds like fun. Um, <laughs> did you consider him to be a mentor? Was that your relationship? Were you more of a studio assistant for him? All of the above? All of the above. It's been a little tricky because I haven't wanted to, um, you know, completely take on his style sort of thing. I guess that was never my intention, but... Um, keep it in mind, I guess, a little bit. And we're definitely very different. He had an amazing color sense, which I have none of. That, I would never that, attempt to <laughs> completely copy his style. I'm going to take that as characteristic humility um, in terms of your comment on the color style. Um, oh, well. Certainly your, your talent in fabrication more than makes up for that. And Oh, thank you. Charles was creating, Charles was creating really elaborate combinations of shapes with very fine, um, delicate little joints from what I understand. Yes. And that, I mean, that gets at one of the key things about being an artist and the mentorships that have shaped all of us is to absorb the lessons that you're role models or mentors can teach you while not just taking on their style, while hopefully integrating the work of multiple people, whether it be technical skills or conceptual ideas, um, into something that comes from your own voice. That's for sure, just absorbing, just absorbing around them. Actually, I have a funny story about the color thing. Um, Charles, we were gonna, try and touch up a piece of his, and it was a green. So he sent me to <clears throat> the cities to get oil paints, Windsor Newton oil paints, and I knew it was a green, so I went and bought every shade of green I could find and spent you know over $100 on green pigments, came back and laid them all out and said, uh, so what do we do, you know, pick one. And he said, what the hell is this? Um, we need blue and yellow. And so I have, that's the lack of color sense I have compared to, it was pretty funny. 
I can understand why you <laughs> picked out green paint. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, maybe Charles could have given more detailed instructions. <laughs> yeah, well, we assumed, assumed yeah. that most people would know that. You assume that you knew, sure. Yeah, very funny. So are there particular sources of inspiration for you? I think about the works of yours that I've seen, um, and some of them, to me, take inspiration from the natural world. There's a beautiful snake in the Anderson Center's office. Yeah, I do. Um, I don't know. I guess I kind of go two ways. I'll try and hold this up. I don't know if it'll work. But awesome. along with the snake lines, it's kind of a lizard, prehistoric Mississippi River. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, that somewhat imaginative, but. So I was going to say that, I guess it could be divided in two. In my castings, I really like to try and go after interesting textures and whatnot. But then I also really like to fabricate things out of just, you know, flat metal and try and turn them into something else. And so I was trying to set it up. There's a table I've been working on here. That's kind of a funny, I don't know if the light is good enough. I can um, see it. Can you see it? Yeah. Does the drawer go in there? In the, the drawer will go in there eventually. <laughs> eventually. Uh, yep. Yeah. And then the lamp attaches to it as well. So it's kind of a, side table with lamp attached. Nice. Anyways, just something I'm working on these days, along with uh, a lot of the restoration that I still do. And so you have effectively found a way to put your skills in fabrication and putting things back together um, and turn them into a a career you've done so much beautiful restoration work for the Anderson Center from repairing the plaster uh, in the residency house to work on the greenhouse and then we've been talking about sculpture restoration I know you work with some of the top art restorers in the Twin Cities um, how does your restoration work and the skills and ideas you get from working on buildings and other artists' work, do those feed into your own artistic practice at all? I think they do. Could be a little bit negatively. Or, well, I shouldn't say that. I think it's changed the way I work, for sure. Um, mainly in that I feel like in my younger days, I was able to be a bit more loose and free with things and now I get a little more obsessed with details and corners and edges Then I've tried to loosen back up but it's not as easy as just trying. So I think the restoration work you really have to pay attention to detail and I think it's definitely seeped in. When you start seeing those things it's really you can't start unseeing them. True. It's the only thing you see <laughs> whenever you walk by it. Yeah. Uh, Are there artistic goals that you feel like you're working towards besides just trying to loosen back up? Are there things that you feel like you're reaching towards but haven't achieved yet? I'm not the best at sort of planning the future or, you know, the five year plan idea. But I would like to do some large scale pieces at some point. Um, and I've done some larger pieces in the past, but without a specific place to put them or, you know, funding, they become a bit of a burden to uh, move around. So I moved away from that. But now I would like to, you know, get a commission from a town or something. Um, I do know that Red Wing just formed an arts and culture commission and oh, working really? with public art here is going to be one of their tasks. Really? So that's great. I have one other thing to hold up here. This crazy bell I cast recently. Oh, wow. That's sort of a, sort of a take on, you know, a Japanese thing, but I just like the, um, different textures playing with 
and how they come out in the casting. So tell me more about the process of making a cast that you use. Yeah, well, this one, this one, you know, it's, that's the fun thing is you can really get away with anything, really. This one I started making out of wax. And then there was this really amazing pattern that was on a kind of a garden lantern kind of thing. So I made a quick, just pressed clay into that and made a quick mold and then was able to um, get some waxes off of that. And then these nubs here, I just did um, kind of silicone blobs out of a tube onto a board and made a mold of that and stuck no those on. Wow. Yeah. So you can really do anything. Once you know what you're doing. Once you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what kind of metal is that bell made out of? That's bronze. Okay. So you're heating, you're making these, is it lost wax? Is it a single yeah. cast? Yes. Yep, you got it. Yep. So I make all the different parts in wax, and then you can warm those up and stick them together. And then you make a mold of that entire wax piece. And then, as you know, you melt out the wax and pour the metal in where the wax was. I did this much of that in high school and still have a fairly bad ring that I made myself. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> and I think that you are making it sound a lot easier than it is for most people. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there are a lot of steps involved. It's funny, um, I'll spend too much time trying to explain it to people who I think seem interested. And then even after that explanation, they'll kind of look at me and say, so you just dip that in the bronze then and you're done? And I say, yes, that's exactly how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> And that is not how it works. So you're carving. <laughs> For, for people at home, I'll just take a stab at explaining it to them and you can correct me where I'm wrong. All right. You're carving an entire object um, out of the wax, or in your case, you're, you're even making some cast out of clay, pouring wax into that, it sounds like. Yes, yeah. And then adding those wax pieces to the thing that you've carved. Yeah. And then all of that goes into yet another cast, probably made out of plaster. Yes, a plaster type, yep. And um, once that plaster goes into an oven, all of the wax melts out. So it's a one and done, no redo type process. Correct. And what's left where the wax gets melted out is this empty negative space that's the exact shape of the thing that you made out of wax and yeah. then you're pouring molten brass into that cavity um and even that tends to obscure how much work goes into these things because you're also making channels i think they're called sprues for the yeah. metal to flow in and then you have to saw those off or grind them yeah. off. And then there's all this cleanup work to make it look good again. That's true. It does not come out of the mold, shiny and polished. Not even close. Pretty rough. Actually, yeah. they call it a rough casting that comes out. And then you're right. The plumbing, the gates and sprues that you mentioned, that's kind of the hardest thing to describe for some reason. But there has to be a way for that wax to get out when you're melting it. And then that's also what you use to pour the metal into that negative space that's left. And then the other thing, too, is that so many things can go wrong at every step of that process. <laughs> that it's, uh, it's exciting when you get something. Right. So some artists are more like things to be really immediate. Um, and others of us are drawn to process. I tend to think of myself as mostly a process artist. Um, yeah. I don't think I am to the extent that you are, but yeah, I tend to take photos and then use those photos to make a thing that I use to make a thing. Um, but I find sometimes that it's such a relief to just take a pen and put it on paper and that's it. 
I it's agree. Not another step from that. <laughs> right. I feel that way about working with wood sometimes. It's nice to work with something a little softer every now and then. Yeah. How often do you make working with wood part of your practice? Um, I've been doing more furniture. And I did get a commission last summer to do a bench for the city of St. Paul. And that is, they had cut down a tree where they were doing a construction project. So I cut the base of the tree kind of lengthwise in half and made some steel feet for it. I'll try and get a photo of that to you. Awesome. And then I've made some other benches with wood tops. And I have one wooden table in here. I've been trying to figure out how to turn wooden legs sort of thing. I'll grab one of these. I'll show you real quick. So it's just kind of a, if I wanted to just make a three legged table, but now I need to replicate this and let it, that's a whole another skill that I don't have, but working on it. So one of the questions I've been asking everyone is if they have advice that they would give to a young artist or somebody who wants to go in to the fields that you work in. Don't expect to make a living. <laughs> no, my, actually my real advice is that I firmly believe that everyone has the artistic ability to do whatever they want. And it really is just, you know, trying it and trying it again. But you know, when people say they don't have, I don't know, I think pretty much everybody does. As I evidenced would, by children playing with things. I always tell people that if they don't think they're creative, they just haven't found their medium yet. Yes. But I totally agree with you. There's this idea in our society that some people are inherently creative and other people aren't, and everyone is inherently creative. That's a better way to put it <laughs> than what I said. Uh, Charles had a funny story. I don't know. How, um, I guess a grade school asked him to come visit, and he met with some classes and teachers, and then the teachers were, I guess they had, we're doing an art project, you know, where all the kids do the same thing kind of thing. Make a circle and then add whatever they tell them to it. And they asked him, uh, Something like, don't you think these kids are great? And Charles said, yeah, they're fantastic until you get a hold of them. <laughs> Which is kind of, can be the problem sometimes. Sure, there's... <laughs> Nothing it, against teachers, there's but an, it can stifle creativity. <laughs> Right. There's an element, a necessary element of our educational system that encourages people to follow the rules and work uh, in structure. But I, um, um, maybe can intimidate people, not intimidate, but discourage people from going outside the lines later in life. Right. And then there's this really unfortunate thing that happens where one kid sees something that another kid does and thinks that it's good or hears the teacher tell them that it's good. And all of a sudden, all the kids are copying the one good idea and not coming up with their own. Yeah. Do you have an online presence or is there a website or some place that people could find your work either online or out in the community? I am working on that. There is, I did do a one collaboration with Eric LeGray that's down at the public library. In Red Wing? In Red Wing. Awesome. We certainly have pieces of yours here at the Anderson Center. There's a bench yes. um, close to the elevator um, and some other pieces in my office right now. So people yep. can absolutely see your work there. Very good. And I just had one other funny story. Um, I think we all never get away from being a little self-conscious of ourselves, I guess. But I recently did a sculpture that was one one of those where it just kind of, I saw it and put it together. It was a quick one, it was kind of fun. But I put it in my front yard and I was a little hesitant at first because I, you know, you never know what people are gonna think. But I was talking to some neighbors during the, during all the unrest, we had kind of a block meeting 
And this guy was looking at, I thought he was looking at me or my shirt. And he said, it's a pelican, right? And I was kind of like, what are you talking about? And then I noticed he was looking over my shoulder at the sculpture I had made. And I said, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, whatever you see, that's great. Pelican it is. Awesome. So, yeah, it was fun that he appreciated it. And, you know, everyone sees something different. Thanks so much for talking with me, Max. This has been a project of the Artistic Response Team of Red Wing, a collaboration between the Anderson Center, Art Reach, Red Wing Arts, Universal Music Center, and the Sheldon Theater. Take care. Yeah, thank you.